The Miracles of Jesus series continues. And the title of the message today is A Faithful Outsider. Has your walk with God changed over the years? Has your walk with God changed over the years? Mine sure has. And it's still changing. It's constantly changing. Slowly, I'm very slow to change. My wife can attest to that. I do not make changes in my life quickly. It takes a long time. But I am in this constant state of change with my walk with God. Gradual, gradually learning, growing, changing, adjusting, maturing. And that's the way it's supposed to be. Yes, we all go through seasons of plateau or, or spiritual dry spells. But my experience has been that if you desire growth in your life, if you're open to the work of the Lord in you, it won't be long before God is stretching you, pushing you, teaching you new things, and taking you to new places. Here's a few verses that uh, kind of highlight this. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 says, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of, of Jesus Christ. He is doing a good work in you, and he's going to complete it when Christ returns someday. If you go to the next chapter of Philippians, it says, For God is working in you. He is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul writes this, We never stop thanking God that when you received his message from us, You didn't think of our words as mere human ideas. You accepted what we said as the very word of God, which of course it is. And this word continues to work in you who believe. God's word and his spirit is continually working in us. So clearly, if God and his his word are at work in us, it is God's desire to grow us, to shape us, to mature us, to make us new. When I went to uh, seminary, where I studied to be a pastor at Acadia, um, one, uh, one year I remember, I think it was maybe my first year I was there, uh, we had a speaker in chapel. And the speaker in chapel talked about two kinds of seminary students. He said there's two kinds of seminary students. The first comes to seminary uh, like, a, like a, a, a ball of clay that is... is um, ready to be molded and shaped by God. Just, just sort of like putty in God's hands that says, Lord, I'm here, do what you want with me. And then God begins this shaping work through the years of seminary. And then he said, there's other students that come to seminary like a solid rock. <laughs> just they've got everything figured out. They know what they believe and they don't want anything to change them. They're not going to let seminary change them. And he said, God has to grind them down. <laughs> Well, I was definitely in the latter camp. I, was, I went to seminary like a solid rock thinking, I am not going to let this place change my views. I'm not going to become liberal and all that sort of stuff. Um, and you know what? God grinded me down and shaped me uh, into, the, into the way, began the process of shaping me into the likeness of his son. Um, but uh, yeah, either way, <laughs> either way, whether you're, you're like putty in God's hands or you're like a, a, a stone that needs to be ground down, God will do what it takes if we're willing to bring about positive change in us. Tim Keller said this. He said, God sees us as we are, loves us as we are, and accepts us as we are. Praise God. I love, that's good news. But by his grace, he does not leave us as we are. He loves us too much to let us languish in our complacency. In the scripture today, we're going to look at, not only do we see Jesus changing the life of a family in crisis by a miraculous exorcism, but we see him using the moment as an opportunity to stretch and grow the people involved. His disciples and the Gentile woman who comes to him for help. An outsider who is full of faith. She's the faithful outsider. So, we're in Matthew chapter 15 today. If you have a Bible at home, go and get it now. Or if you've got a Bible app on your phone, pull it up and follow along with us. It's always good to follow along. Um, and, and especially if you've got a paper Bible, it's good to get in the habit of, 
learning where you find things and all that sort of stuff. <clears throat> so Matthew is in the New Testament. It's the first book of the New Testament, which is this later in the Bible. So the Bible's divided into two parts, Old Testament, New Testament. And the New Testament's a lot smaller. It's only like this much, and the Old Testament's this much. So anyway, Matthew, and we're going to be in chapter 15 today, starting at verse 21. And this is what it says. <clears throat> Then Jesus left Galilee and went north to the region of Tyre and Sidon. Why did he go here? Before we continue, why did he go here? Well, Mark's uh, account of this story in Mark's gospel tells us that they went. They went to. um, They went and didn't want anyone to know they went, which implies that they were trying to get away. Uh, It was sort of like a, a, a retreat for him and the disciples. So they went to Tyre and Sidon, which is outside of the region of Galilee, because. Uh, Jesus wasn't as well known there. There wasn't crowds following them everywhere they went. So they went and, and kind of left um, the Jewish region to get far from the madding crowd. That's what they did. Okay, so let's keep going. Verse 22. A Gentile woman who lived there came to him. I guess they didn't, weren't really able to fully get away. Pleading, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David, for my daughter is possessed by a demon that torments her severely. Jesus gave her no reply, not even a word. Then his disciples urged him to send her away. Tell her to go away, they said. She's bothering us with all her begging. Then Jesus said to the woman, I was only sent to help God's lost sheep, the people of Israel. But she came and worshipped him, pleading again, Lord, help me. Jesus responded, It isn't right to take food from the children and throw it to the dogs. She replied, That's true, Lord, but even the dogs are allowed to eat the scraps that fall beneath their master's table. Dear woman, Jesus said to her, Your faith is great. Your request is granted. And her daughter was instantly healed. Wow. Now, in, in the podcast that I recorded last week with my friend Greg Minette, if, I hope you had a chance to listen to it. Um, we talked about the reliability of the gospel accounts, among other things. One of the things we didn't talk about is this thing called the criterion of embarrassment. This is something that uh, biblical scholars uh, refer to, to talk about the credibility of uh, the New Testament. One of the reasons that we can trust that what we have in the New Testament is telling us true stories, is that sometimes the stories that are told are embarrassing, potentially embarrassing for the hero of the story, who is Jesus, or in some cases the disciples, Uh, but in this case, Jesus. So basically what that's saying is that if a story is told and and the character who's supposed to be, you know, uh, held up in in a positive light uh, does something that comes across as embarrassing, um, it's more likely to be a true story because who is going to sit down? Who, what New Testament disciples are going to sit down and create a craft out of their imagination a story about Jesus that makes him look bad? They're not going to do that. So a story like this, one of the reasons that we can believe that it's true, aside from faith and that we trust that God, it's God's word, but one of the reasons from an academic perspective is that on the surface, it kind of makes Jesus look bad. It kind of makes, it's kind of embarrassing. It, it seems like the way that Jesus treats this woman in this story is at best rude and at worst racist. Was Jesus racist? This is one of those passages that I read and I scratch my head and I move on. <laughs> Maybe you've done the same with this passage as you've come to it. Boy, Jesus seems awful mean to this woman. He calls her a dog. What on earth is going on here? Well, we need to take a closer look uh, to understand all the nuances of what's happening here. And I think it's important. I think it's interesting, actually. I think it's God's timing. Uh, you know, I planned, I mapped out this sermon series months ago. And, uh, and in God's timing, here we are talking about um, racism and bias and ethnocentricity and all these things that come up as a result of this story. When racism is at the top of our mind as Canadians right now, with the killing of the, of the Islamic family in Ontario and with the discovery of the remains at the Kamloops Indian Residential School, 
Uh, it's pretty amazing that, that the timing of this scripture right now uh, for this moment. So here's what I want to say. Not only was Jesus not being racist or rude, I think he was overtly confronting and challenging racism in this moment with this woman. So let's, how do we get there? Well, we can see that here when we get a fuller picture, uh, sorry, we can see that here. We can see that Jesus wasn't really being racist, but actually was probably challenging racism uh, when we get a fuller picture of this moment in the context of Jesus' ministry. <clears throat> Before we can make sense of what Jesus was doing in this conversation with this Gentile woman, let's understand a few key things in some context. So, first of all, in the previous verses of Matthew chapter 15 that we didn't read this morning, Jesus rejected traditional notions of clean and unclean. Every text has a context. And the context in which Matthew chose to tell this story is right after Jesus had a discussion with Jewish leaders about the Jewish purity laws. And we won't read it all right now, but essentially... Jesus says that what you eat, or whether or not you perform ceremonial hand washing, doesn't make you clean or unclean, but it's what comes out of your heart that makes you clean or unclean. And that's really, really important, Um, and it's really significant. It's really something, because the Jewish people under the Old Testament were set apart, special, chosen by God, and it was largely these ceremonial religious laws and rituals that made them distinct from the Gentile world around them. And so if Jesus denies the importance of those laws, if Jesus says, yeah, yeah, you know what, all this external stuff, like what you're eating or how you're washing your hands or circumcision and all these different things that the Jewish people practice, if those things aren't important anymore under the new covenant that he was bringing in, but what is in your heart is what matters, then that is, that significantly uh, is, is stating that these ethnic barriers that existed, these divisions between Jew and Gentile that were largely um, evident by these symbolic outward things, those barriers are being torn down. Jesus is saying those ethnic barriers don't matter anymore. That's, that's hugely significant. In fact, if we get, and when we get into Paul's letters, he says there is neither Jew nor Greek anymore in the gospel in the kingdom of God, Jew and Gentile, those divisions become irrelevant. So Jesus rejected traditional notions of clean and unclean right before this story. That tells you something. Now, the next point, Jesus went to places ethnocentric Jews tried to avoid. Immediately after this talk about cleanness and uncleanness, we have the story we read today. Jesus and his disciples travel to Gentile territory. Tyre and Sidon uh, are two cities, both in modern-day Lebanon, and uh, hopefully if we ever get a chance as a church, COVID things change, and we get a chance to go take a team to Lebanon to visit our step partners, we may get to go see some of these historic sites. There's ruins in Tyre and Sidon, where that little red marker is on the map there. That's where Tyre is, and just north of that is Sidon, and just north of that is Beirut, where our, uh, where our partners live and work. Um, But it is outside of the region of where the Jewish people lived. And not only was it outside of Jewish territory, not only was it Gentile territory, but it was considered um, hostile territory. The people of that region, uh, in some translations, uh, it refers to this woman as a Canaanite woman. That's an intentional word uh, to indicate, you know, the Canaanites were the enemies of the Israel, of, of the Jewish people in the Old Testament. And they call this woman a Canaanite. You know, she's not just a Gentile. She's part of this group of people that are antagonistic towards Israel. So this is not the sort of place that a good Jew would go for a weekend getaway, right? Good Jews don't go to Tyre and Sidon. They could be negatively negatively influenced by those wicked people there, the Jewish people would think. Gentiles were considered unclean. Boy, you might come into contact with them. You might have a conversation with one of them. Oh, it could rub off on you, all of this evilness. Um... I think the placement of this trip right after the talk of unclean food is trying to tell us something. 
just as Jesus challenged the view that certain foods were unclean. He was challenging the idea that certain people groups were unclean. We know that Jesus' message, his gospel, the kingdom, was always intended for the whole world. Yes, Jesus himself mostly stayed in Galilee and Judea throughout his three-year ministry. His short time on earth was directly primar- directed primarily toward the Jews, but not exclusively. And that's really significant. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, that the gospel is for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Now, sometimes when we read that, we get hung up on the to the Jew first thing. Uh, But what we're supposed to be amazed at in that statement of Paul is that it's also for Gentiles. It's not only for the Jewish people. Jesus came for the whole world, which was always God's plan. If you go back to the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis chapter 12, when God first makes a covenant with Abram, he says to him, in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That was always God's intention when he began the plan of salvation right from the very beginning. It was always God's plan that it was never going to be an ex- it was it wasn't always going to be an exclusive Jewish Israel only thing. It was always the intention to be for the whole world. And that's what we see with Jesus. Jesus fulfills that promise as a as a descendant of Abraham that he becomes a blessing, the savior, the king, the Messiah not just for Israel, but for the whole world. And Jesus' occasional, uh, Jesus' ministry occasionally did go outside the borders of Israel, like in this story. And that foreshadows the work of the church after Jesus' resurrection, when they would indeed take the gospel to the ends of the earth. All right, so this is some context here. What else is happening? Well, in the context of Jesus' ministry in, in general, we know that he speaks favorably of ethnic outsiders. The best example of this is the parable of the Good Samaritan. Good Samaritan would have been an oxymoron in first century Jewish culture. Samaritans aren't good. They're rotten, wicked people that are not like us. And Jesus chooses to make a Samaritan the hero of his parable on purpose, to challenge their bigotry and their stereotypes. We also see right in this story a way in which Jesus signals his love of Gentiles. In verse 28, Jesus says to her, Dear woman, your faith is great. He says to this Gentile woman, this Canaanite woman, that she has great faith. The only other time that Jesus commends someone for, their, for the greatness of their faith in Matthew's gospel is when he's speaking to a Roman centurion, another Gentile. Who are the people that in Matthew's gospel that Jesus calls of little faith? It's his disciples on occasion when they don't demonstrate faith. He says, ye of little faith, the Jewish disciples. So in Matthew's gospel, who are the people of great faith? It's Gentiles. Who are the people of little faith? The disciples. You see, these are signals that that are, are in the ministry of Jesus, recorded by Matthew, to show us that Jesus is breaking down these ethnic boundaries that have existed in the past. He speaks favorably of ethnic outsiders. And last of all, Jesus promises a kingdom that is ethnically diverse. The church today already reflects this. Praise God, the demographics of the global church are incredibly diverse and becoming more and more diverse as time goes on. And we know that according to uh, the revelation that Jesus gave to John, heaven will be populated with people of every tribe, language, and nation on earth. Hallelujah. So, all of that considered, all of that context considered, it seems highly unlikely that Jesus is harboring racist feelings towards this woman. Highly unlikely that he's hesitating to help this woman because she's not one of us Jews, because she's a Gentile. That just doesn't fit at all with the picture of Jesus and his mission, and even in the context of Matthew chapter 15. 
In, and in fact, he does help the woman, doesn't he? He affirms her faith and he heals her daughter. You know, if you leave this story feeling like Jesus is being rude or racist, remind yourself of how the story ends. Before you jump to conclusions, read the conclusion. There's a dear lady in our church, I won't mention her name, but she told me that when she picks up a new book, she starts by reading the ending first. <laughs> and then if she likes how it ends, she goes back and reads the book. But if she doesn't like the ending, she says, ah, I'm not going to waste my time if, I, if it doesn't end the way I want it to end. <laughs> I like that. That's funny. Um, but, um, but do that with this story, right? Don't read and, oh, Jesus is being a jerk. Read what happens at the end. He says, you're, you're, you've got great faith. And he commends her and he heals her daughter. And he holds her up as an example. So, was, is Jesus racist? No, he's not racist. Was he treating this woman with, uh, with, with uh, bigotry and stereotypic, stereotypes and all that stuff? No, that can't be what Jesus was doing. So then, what was Jesus doing? <laughs> What is this about? What is going on here? Well, we know that he does perform this incredible, powerful, unmatched miracle of, of an exorcism at a distance. I mean, who does that? A long distance exorcism. That's just incredible. But what is going on with his strange interaction with this woman? Why this back and forth dialogue? Well, I think what Jesus was doing is twofold. I think he was growing the disciples in this moment, teaching them, stretching them, and doing the same with the woman. Much like the two kinds of seminary students I talked about, those who are like hardened rock who need to be chiseled away at and ground down by the Spirit of God, and those who come to seminary like clay ready to be molded, um, I think the disciples were demonstrating hardness of heart that Jesus wanted to soften. And the woman here was showing great faith that Jesus wanted to mold and make even stronger. So let's start by talking about the disciples. I believe Jesus was interested here in growing the disciples' compassion. When I studied this passage, I couldn't make sense of verse 23 at first. It says that Jesus gave her no reply. She comes begging for help for her daughter who's possessed. And it says Jesus gave her no reply, not even a word. I thought, why would Jesus do that? Why wouldn't he acknowledge her? It seems awful mean, doesn't it? Mean-spirited, rude, harsh. Then it came to me. I think the reason that Jesus didn't answer this woman is he wanted to hear how the disciples would respond before he said anything. As much as the story seems like he was testing the woman, I think he was also testing the disciples. This was a test, and they failed the test. They, they say, send her packing. She's annoying. She's bothering us. Get rid of this woman. And likely, likely, doesn't tell us this, but I think it's very likely that there was racist undertones in their attitude. We didn't come to minister to these people. We're on vacation. But Jesus needs to soften their hearts towards Gentiles. After all, these very disciples would be the ones who would be expected to take the gospel to the Gentiles. So, this is a teachable moment. You ever have those as a family? You know, something happens and you go, this is a teachable moment. Let's learn from this. Well, this is a, that's what Jesus is doing. This is an opportunity for growth for the disciples. So if that's the case, why does it seem like Jesus is reiterating, agreeing with their likely racist attitudes? You know, he says, I was only sent for the Israelites. He says to the woman, I was only sent for the Israelites. He says to her, God's children are the Jews. Why should I help, help Gentile dogs like you? Whew, that's harsh words coming from Jesus. Well, I think the challenge for us reading this today, having not been there, 
is that we don't, we can't see Jesus's body language. We can't hear his tone of voice. And that makes a big difference. For one thing, Jesus's word, one indication here that he's not being quite as harsh as we think, is that the word translated dog, as he calls this woman, refers to this woman as a dog, is not the same word that Jews typically used to call Gentiles dogs. They did call Gentiles dogs. They thought of them as these awful, mangy, wild dogs that are annoying and awful, flea-ridden. Um, it's a different word that Jesus uses here than the typical word that they would use for dogs. It means something more like a domesticated pet, like a dog that you like. <laughs> Think Ken and Sheila Vandersteen's new puppy, Bernie. Here's a picture I asked her to send me. Oh, isn't he cute? Oh, man. P- Bernie's just so sweet. Think Bernie, not the junkyard dog from classic 90s movie, The Sandlot, <laughs> whose name was Hercules, I think. They called him the beast. All right, so Jesus is using more of the, the Bernie kind of dog. He's referring to that kind of dog, not the beast. But I also think Jesus is being clever here. He's mirroring the negative attitude of the disciples to expose it as much, to turn it on its head, like saying out loud what they were thinking so they can hear how dumb it sounds. I think that's what Jesus was doing. Yeah, you're right, guys. We should send this girl away. I mean, she's not even Jewish. Why should we give her the time of day? Yeah, that's right, Jesus. Yeah, you said it, man. And then the zinger. Dear woman, your faith is great. And the disciples immediately recognize, oh, I see. (laughs) One of the commentators I was reading as I was studying He said, the disciples in this moment were the disciples. But before we get too hard on these guys, before we come to, oh yeah, these idiot disciples, let's ask ourselves, what unloving, uncaring attitudes does Jesus want to change in me? What discrimination, bigotry, and even racism is under the surface in my life? For many of us, Jesus needs to soften our hearts. And that's part of the growth that he's working in us. Let's be honest about the sinful tendencies in us and invite the Lord to change us. I think we've got some of the disciple in us as well. Okay. So, what's Jesus doing? I think he is stretching the disciples. I think he's, he's growing them in the area of compassion. He's trying to soften their hearts towards outsiders. Simultaneously, he is growing the Gentile woman's faith. Truth is, this lady, when she walked into this room, she had a surprising level of faith in Jesus already. Her confidence in Jesus is very evident. In verse 22, it tells us that she came to him. She came to him. Now think about this. She's living in a foreign land. She's not Jewish. She came, she chose to come to Jesus. She had other options, you know. A temple dedicated to the god Eshman, a god of healing, was located just three miles northwest of Sidon. A god of healing. And yet she chose to come to Jesus. She's got faith. In Jesus. She sees something in Jesus that's different than what the world offers. In verse 22, it also says that she calls him Lord, and she calls him Son of David. Son of David. She recognized him to be the Jewish Messiah, yes. But that's not all. There's actually a connection between this title, Son of David, and the exorcism of demons. What is this about? Well, in the Old Testament, who is the most famous son of David. Solomon, right? Solomon is literally David's son who becomes his heir to the throne and becomes the king. Solomon, the son of David, was exceptionally wise. He wrote a lot of the Proverbs and so on. And even in the area of medicine, he was considered to be brilliant. Josephus, the ancient Jewish historian, wrote that Solomon had mastered the formula for exercising demons from people. You know, um, 
Demon possession is not something that we read about at all in the Old Testament. It's like not a thing. It's all through the Gospels, but really in the Old Testament, we don't read about it at all. Um, but we, the tradition in the Jewish, uh, Jewish history and the Jewish tradition was that Solomon was uh, an exorcist and that he'd mastered the art of it. And his, Solomon's, according to Josephus, Solomon's method for exercising demons involved extracting the demon out of the nostrils using a metal ring. <laughs> Whoa, man. That does not sound legitimate to me. <laughs> but nevertheless, this was the tradition. This was the belief that Solomon, the literal son of David, had the power to remove demons from people uniquely, a power that others did not have. So when we come to the New Testament and we read about Jesus being called son of David, in some cases, the person using that title might be thinking about, might be referring to thinking about Solomon and his power to cast out demons. They're thinking it's, it's an expression of faith in Jesus to also cast out demons. So this woman comes to Jesus when she could have gone other places, but she chooses to come to Jesus, which was a bold move coming to this outsider. She calls him Lord. She calls him son of David, expressing faith in his ability to cast out demons and expressing that he is the Jewish Messiah. And what's my point here? My point here is that this woman who came to Jesus for her daughter to be set free from demon clearly has faith already. She's got a strong faith when she walks through the door. And brilliantly, Jesus' efforts to expose the disciples' attitudes also pushes this woman to increase the faith she already has. Jesus recognizes in her that she has faith, and he sees an opportunity to take her to the next level. Let me reread verses 24 to 27 just to remind ourselves of what happens. So uh, the disciples tell her, say, let's get rid of this woman. And Jesus said to her, I was sent only to help God's lost sheep, the people of Israel. He's, he's kind of pushing back against her a little bit to see what she has to say. But she came and worshiped him, pleading again, Lord, help me. Now she's worshiping him. Jesus responded, it isn't right to take food from the children and throw it to the dogs. And she replied, that's true, Lord, but even the dogs are allowed to eat the scraps that fall beneath their master's table. So you can see this progression of faith that happens. She's not giving up. She gets more and more passionate with each of the things that Jesus says. She reminds me, actually, of Jacob wrestling the angel in the Old Testament. You remember this story? Jesus, uh, Jacob is wrestling with this angel and he, and he won't let go without a blessing. I'm not letting you go until you give me a blessing, angel. And Jesus, through this clever and unusual way of speaking to her, draws out of her that kind of attitude, that deeper faith than wh what she had when she came through the door. Yes, she had faith. She had a strong faith already. And yet, when she leaves this moment with Jesus, her faith is even greater. So though it seems at first like Jesus is discouraging her faith, He's actually developing her faith. Praise God. So good. All right. Here's the takeaway for us. Jesus wants to develop a greater faith in all of us as well. A deeper desire for him. A wider dependence on him. Persistence in our prayer to him. And passion in our pursuit of him. The greatest commandment, Jesus said, is to love the Lord your God a little bit. No, to love the Lord your God on occasion. No, to love the Lord your God with all of your heart and soul and mind and strength. To be totally devoted and crazy and nuts about Jesus. That's what Jesus wants from us. That kind of love of God. That kind of faith. In Jeremiah 29 verse 13, it says you, God says, you will seek me and find me. When you seek me with all your heart. You want to find God. You want to find God in the deepest ways that you can find him. You want to experience God in the most deepest ways that you can experience God. Seek him with all your heart. Be all in for Jesus. All right, in conclusion, this is not just a miracle story where Jesus shows off his power. It is that. 
but it's also a story of Jesus being a brilliant teacher. He is using a moment to strategically stretch and grow the people in his orbit. And God is constantly doing the same thing in all of our lives, using moments every day, using life's experiences to stretch us, to grow us. God wants you to grow. So how is God growing your faith these days? Is he stretching you? Is he pushing you? Is he opening your eyes to new things? Are you unlearning wrong things? Are you deconstructing and reconstructing your faith? Is he calling you outside of your comfort zone? Those are all really good things. If you can say yes to those questions, to any of those questions, that's really, really good. So let's commit to change. Let's commit to growth. Let's welcome the work of God in our lives, whether that's grinding us down or chiseling away at us or building us up and molding us or both, whatever it looks like. He can make beautiful things out of our lives and even use us disciples to accomplish his beautiful mission on earth. Praise God. I am sure of this, Paul writes, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's have a time of worship now before we close in prayer.